Okay, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Live from the Sword Coast podcast. My name is Kevin Madison, and uh, I will be your friendly dungeon muser this evening. Uh, tonight, I am going to be doing something a little, well, it's a little different from what I've been doing usually. Uh, but it will, oh, sorry, that's me in the background just making sure that I'm actually streaming. Um, I'm uh, fairly behind on my reviews that I've been posting on this channel, so I thought that I would jump back in with both feet and offer uh, some thoughts on the various uh, supplements that have been published for one of my favorite games at present, uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord, published by Robert Schwab's uh, company, which is, I think, Schwab Entertainment? Yeah, Schwab Entertainment, LLC. So, uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord, if you're not familiar with it, is a dark horror fantasy game uh, published by Robert Schwab. It's kind of thought, if you think of it as a cross between uh, Dungeons and & Dragons and the old uh, Warhammer fantasy role-playing game, uh, that's a pretty close uh, summary of it. I'm going to include, I forgot to do it uh, beforehand because I'm a fucking idiot, but I am going to include a, a link in my description. I, ha I have a pretty exhaustive review of the game itself on uh, elsewhere on the, on the channel, and I will link to that. Uh, but what I'm going to do uh, tonight is to go through some of the other supplements that uh, I have picked up. Now, uh, I have uh, everything that is available in print I have uh, picked up so far. There are, uh, for, for the game, um, and all of the supplements I'm going to talk about uh, tonight are all things that I have purchased through Drive Through RPG through their print on demand service. Uh, if you aren't, uh, if you're not familiar with the, the print on demand service, it's really worth checking out. Like the uh, the quality of the prints that you get from it uh, are, are really quite good. Uh, certainly, I mean, I, I don't think that the uh, the pages are quite as nice as some of the, like the, the deluxe uh, books that I've picked up uh, from uh, from other publishers, but they're certainly on par with um, the best of the middling products, I, I suppose. Like, there's certainly nothing wrong with them whatsoever, uh, and uh, the colors are are quite good on the um, on the the, uh, the step up quality. I, I can't remember what they call it, but there's two different qualities of of paper you can get. Uh, the binding is terrific, uh, and um, the prices are really quite reasonable. The shipping, uh, you kind of have to be strategic with it if you want to try and save money. Um, I'm stupid with my money as far as uh, role-playing games go, so I tend to, as soon as it's available for print-on-demand, I will order it and uh, be damned to the uh, shipping prices. But um, in any event, if you're interested, as we I go through this, if you find that you're interested in checking out any of these uh, games, you can find the print-on-demand service on the drive through RPG uh, website, if you go to Schwalbe Entertainment's subpage or their store, whatever the hell they call it. So um, I, I don't have any, I, I have not organized this um, this review uh, of, or these reviews apart from just sort of setting the books down. What I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to depart from my usual sort of format where I, I go through this really comprehensive discussion of, you know, what it's about, what you do and blah, blah, blah. I think that that's been done in my last review of uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. So if you want to know what the game itself is about, then I would suggest starting with that. Um, the, a, a nutshell version, though, is that this is a terrific role-playing game. I thoroughly love playing it. I've played through this game from zero to level 10, and I've been running it for about a year and a half. I mean, honestly, I, I picked up the game shortly after uh, it came out. I missed it on the Kickstarter, so I didn't get that, but shortly after the game came out, I, I picked it up, and I've been running it for a couple of years now, and I love the game. It's a really, really great game. So anyway, let's talk about what... Uh, the, uh, the supplements are. So um, I, I don't really have an order to these, but what I'll try and do is try and talk about the ones that I have, uh, I've used the most. And then the structure for each of these is I'll tell you what's in the book and what I've used it for. Um, and I'm hoping that will give you an idea of, you know, what you can do to repurpose this. Uh, I have run one uh, campaign, the campaign I played in and the campaign that I've been, my first campaign with Shadow of the Demon Lord, that went from level zero to about level six or seven. I can't remember. Um, I, I use that as the default uh, setting, but the campaign I'm currently running, I've actually been using a DD and d setting. So I've been reskinning stuff to feel more traditionally Dungeons and Dragons-ish. Uh, and uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord is close, but it definitely has a very horror vibe to it for the, for all the different races and, and um, the spells and, and, and so forth. So. Uh, the first supplement that came out for it uh, was the Demon Lord's Companion. And one of the things that's really, this is sort of like a, a um, if you're going to be taking a step into the wider products, I would suggest this as your first purchase because the material that's in this is the stuff that Robert Schwab has said that he would have included in the core rulebook and he considers canon. It can in the sense that this is core material. 
Uh, I, I honestly don't know why they didn't keep it in the core book. I mean, the core book itself has just a ton of stuff. It is one of the most rich and full single uh, role-playing game core books of, of any game I've ever seen. It's really terrific. And the Demon Lord's Companion carries on with that, uh, uh, cramming just a ton of really cool and useful stuff in it. The things that it includes are things like the uh, fawn. So in the Shadow of the Demon Lord world, uh, half-elves effectively are like this. They're fawns, not, um, you know, effectively like kind of human-looking elves or elfish-looking humans. Uh, they add halflings in it. They add uh, a bunch of paths. Now, just as a refresher, if you're not familiar with Shadow of the Demon Lord or you're not super familiar with it, in the place of classes, Shadow of the Demon Lord uses something called paths. And you get to pick a path at uh, different levels. The game itself is structured from, to play from level 0 up to level 10. And then you make a decision for what your different paths are. At level one, you pick a novice path. At level three, you pick an expert path. And then at level seven, you pick a master path. Uh, and then uh, you also start the game by picking an ancestry. And ancestry is kind of what is considered races or referred to as races in a lot of other role-playing games. So your character ends up being this really interesting mix of the different elements that you're making into your, uh, you know, you're picking as you go through your character. And what this game does, or rather what this product does, is it adds a bunch of new, uh, really core expert paths. Uh, there's one, Elementalist, which, to be honest, Elementalist doesn't really, you know, it's a, little, it's a very Elemental-oriented caster, which is a signature thing in, in a lot of fantasy role-playing games, but I that particular path doesn't really float my boat. But uh, Mountebank, which is kind of like a uh, charlatan and liar, Mystic, which is the Shadow of the Demon Lord equivalent of a monk, which is really, really cool in play. A psychic, a sage, uh, a shaman, a swashbuckler, and I've seen a swashbuckler in play, and it's really quite cool. And a warden. A warden is really neat because it's effectively like the... In 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons, they had a, a class called... Uh, I think it was called Warden, which was like a tanking class, but it was more nature-bent. Robert Schwab, the, the author of this, he cut his teeth uh, on a lot of fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons stuff, so it's kind of cool to see some fourth edition elements that are in here. If you're more of a fifth edition D and D player, the Warden is the um, I think it's the Path of the Ancients uh, specialty for paladins. It's the one that that does a lot of like you know nature and stuff like that. But anyway, so the Warden's in there, so it adds you some interesting uh, new um, expert paths that are fairly I think fairly iconic in, as far as D and D goes. Uh, or at least fantasy role playing goes. Uh, master paths include things like alchemist, blackguard, corsair, demonologist, entropist, martial artist, medium, psychokinetic, and a bunch of other ones. There's a bunch of great items that are added in here too. Some cool uh, alchemical items, uh, forbidden items, and then some new potions. Uh, it gives you rules for using vehicles, which is is pretty cool. And because Shadow of the Demon Lord has a a distinctly sci um, not cyberpunk. <laughs> There's no cybertech in this. There is, however, steampunk uh, stuff in it. You'll see rules in here for vehicles like locomotive engine or airship, or uh, actually, that's the only really fancy <laughs> uh, steampunky stuff. And then otherwise, some signature uh, some fantasy things like wagon and sailing ship and so forth. And the magic section here adds some other, again, I think they're pretty core to uh, fantasy role playing, uh, things like alchemy. Demonology, death, spiritualism, telepathy, and telekinesis. And uh, then it's got some extra rules for things called incantations. And incantations are kind of like uh, scrolls in uh, Dungeons and Dragons, where it's the like written, codified versions of uh, magical spells. Uh, then it gives you some new uh, game master tools. And there are some rules for hauntings, which is kind of like a watered down version of haunts from Pathfinder. Uh, they're not. I, I actually haven't used them uh, because I don't. I don't find them super interesting. Uh, there is some neat rules for null magic in here and void shoals, which are sort of like where the demon lord from the void sort of like pushes through into reality. That's kind of neat. Uh, gives you a couple more relics, and relics are sort of the uh, shadow of the demon lord equivalent of artifacts or really powerful magical items. So that's some good stuff to go from. There's not a lot of examples of it in the core book, so it's good to have a couple more examples in here. Uh, it expands the beast area to include a couple other thing, uh, a couple other creatures that are again fairly you know signature to fantasy role playing, like centaurs, uh, brownies. There's a thing called a slime brute, which is kind of like a shambling mound. 
uh, a rock, and then there's oh, and a spectrum. And they're pretty much like translated versions of what D and D monsters are. So that's what you get in the Demon Lord's Companion. More recently, the Demon Lord's Companion Two came out. This includes uh, a lot more esoteric things than what the core, the first Demon Lord Companion uh, had. Um, Robert Schwab ha has said that this is intended to push beyond the original concept of the game. This is to put new ideas out there and some really off the wall stuff. And it really does. I don't know if you can see here, but you got like, you know, roach men you can play. You know, there's these little guys which are effectively like hairless mole men. Uh, and then there are uh, sylphs, and I can't remember what the other ones are called, but they're effectively like uh, the elemental attuned um, humanoids. So if you think of like Ganassi from 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, or really any version of Dun Dungeons and Dragons post 3, so 3rd third, third, third edition, 3.5, 4, 5th, uh, if you think of Ganassi, that's what uh, some of these things are. There's also a, an unusual race called the Farron, which change into cats. And uh, none of these things really float my boat necessarily, but uh, if you are someone who, oh, and there's the Naga as well too, this kind of like snake people. Um, none of that stuff really floats my boat because they're they're not just unusual characters; they're just really, really alien. But I, if that is something that really you know um, is up your alley, there's a lot of interesting idea. Like these are the Yarath, those sort of like um, roach people, and they're all they've all got some great. Um, background uh, stuff as well too, so you can help fill in the backstory that's appropriate for whatever um, ancestry that you've chosen for your character. Uh, it introduces an idea called group themes, which I really like. Uh, I haven't used these yet because I was using uh, something else. I was using some alternate uh, fortune point rules in um, in my game. But uh, what this does is, if you want to uh, uh, apply like a uh, template to your group, to your gaming group. Uh, then this, what this does is it gives you some extra little rules that you can use to, to sort of support that flavor and then give the players ways to interfere with the dice rolls. So uh, the, the themes that are included in here uh, we, are things like bold explorers, cunning merchants, daring scoundrels, desperate rebels, devoted servants, driven peacemakers. There's 20 of them, so I'm not going to go through all of them necessarily. <laughs> Loyal soldiers, murderous gangsters, noble entourage. Um, so the, the re, the, I won't go through all of them, but one way to think of these things, in addition to just you know adding extra rules to 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 play up the flavor of whatever game you're playing, I think this gives you some really good ideas of what you can actually do with this game. You know, like uh, rather than just playing a traditional sort of like adventurers on the go, you know, mercenary type things. You know, you could play sworn defenders. They're like you know part of a um, a holy order, and they're for whatever way, you know, whatever ancestry and path that they're playing, they're going to have some relation to this this uh, religion. Uh, embattled survivors, maybe they've uh, the shadow of the demon lord is coming by annihilating, you know, the dead are rising from the graves and they're killing everybody. And your group happens to be the ones who survive the first onslaught of this uh, undead horde. Famed entertainers, that would be really interesting. In this uh, cunning, uh, bold explorers actually might be really interesting too, because the the idea of uh, pushing out beyond the barriers of the you know, the known world, uh, exploring those unknown parts of the map, uh, that could be a really fun campaign too. And uh, in particular, if you set it up so that your characters are the ones by pushing those boundaries who unleash the threat of the demon lord on the world. So mm, that gives me some ideas for my next campaign. Oh, and occult investigators is, is one of them as well. And I love that. I think it's a really great idea for a campaign too. Kind of like uh, a much, much, much darker version of Ghostbusters. Um, then the next thing you do is they introduce some new uh, paths as well. Some of these are fairly esoteric. So uh, there's one called the Auspex, which is kind of like someone who is really attuned to divination magic or like oracular magic. And uh, that's a little strange. Silhouette I really love because it's kind of like, honestly, it's like the um, Shadow Dancer, I think it's called. In uh, It's a prestige class that was introduced in third edition D&D. But if you dig the idea of playing a character who's kind of a, you know, a swordsman or woman who wields or manipulates shadow around them. That's exactly what this expert path does. So that's pretty cool. And because of the flexibility of the system, you can actually decide whether you want to go into that as a rogue, you know, and play up the sort of sneaky bit, or you could go into as a fighter to be more of a, 
armed combatant. Uh, you could go in as a priest, you know, uh, who's bringing in some kind of uh, divine aspect to it, or you could go into it as a magician, where you're really leaning into the magic stuff, and this just happens to add some some um, melee combat elements to your to your mage thing. So. And the last one is um, Wangatur, and I, to be honest, I don't really get that one. Um, I haven't really tried to wrap my head around it, but it's I understand it's sort of like a cruder version of a, of a mage. If I've got that wrong, someone please um, feel free to correct me in the comments below, and I'd, I'd appreciate that. And the final one is a ward scribe, who's someone who sort of really leans into or specializes in uh, runic and protection magic. And that's a cool idea, too, I, even if just a, a thematic idea of a character you know, inscribing a bunch of runes and, and stuff on them. The picture they've got for this is a clockwork character who's got a bunch of runes on him or her and then also marking a bunch of cool stuff on the ground. So that's kind of cool. Um, there is a bunch of interesting um, master paths as well, too. And there's one that uh, I, is worth mentioning because it's something that two of my players have taken. Now, one of the signature parts of Shadow of the Demon Lord, because it is a horror uh, fantasy game and horror is the first thing it is there is some really awesome um, or there are some really awesome rules for corruption and uh, there are also rules for insanity which come from when your character is scared or when your character I mean really it's scared or damaged by like mind-bending stuff um, but insanity can be dealt with insanity can um, can be reduced uh, through spells through uh, outbreaks of madness and, and things like that corruption generally speaking, does not go away. There's not a way of, of easily divesting yourself of corruption. There's nothing in the core book that tells you how you get rid of corruption. However, the Cenobite Master Path specifically gets you uh, or gets rid of your corruption. You reduce your corruption total down to zero. Um, and the reason it's worth mentioning is because it's it, there are some interesting rules in uh, the next book I'm going to talk about, Exquisite Agony, where you can uh, characters can be tempted with demonic paths and they can get a bunch of cool stuff but they get a bunch of corruption for it and i use those rules to structure for my game the uh basically like the the degeneration of the minotaurs because i had two players who were playing minotaurs in my game and uh, I, I gave some stuff to them to sort of tempt them to to go to corruption where they would answer the call of their demon lord the uh, baphomet and if they did they would get some great benefits to their strength. They might get bigger and so, and so forth, but commensurately, they would also get corruption. And I also made them make a will save, so they might get double the benefit and double the corruption without them intending to do that. But one of my players, wisely at level six, just before he level seven, got a shit ton of benefits and then suddenly took Cenobite and suddenly found himself with no corruption. So he had all the benefits of the pact, but none of the corruption. Now, if I was a more, um, if I really cared more, I, I would take that stuff back. I suppose you could do that to balance it. Whatever gifts they got from corruption, they would lose when they lose their corruption. Um, but uh, to be honest, that character, uh, not by my hand, by another player's hand, unfortunately, but uh, that player actually, or that character actually died um, last session uh, at the time of recording. So I suppose the, uh, the lesson to be learned here is that uh, even though Cenobite provides you a way of sort of getting around that uh, that uh, cheat, uh, the the high cost of corruption, I suppose karma will get back at you anyway. So, or at least that's one way of looking at it. Um, other another interesting uh, master path that is introduced here that I think is neat is Sleuth, because uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord doesn't really read as more of a you know investigative mystery sort of game. Uh, it, it's cool to see them introduce rules for these types of things like the occult investigator and sleuth and uh, more social stuff because it, again it's a horror game first and there's plenty of other games that are great horror games that don't do the fantasy or the combat or whatever so you could run a really terrific game i think if you leaned into just the investigative side that's the last time i use the phrase leaned in i realize i've used that a bunch of times already uh, the other stuff that's in here is uh, they introduce some rules for invocation, which is this kind of neat kind of magic where your uh, the caster takes on like they call, it's a daemon they that they say inhabits you, but um, it's kind of like your your chant like a loa uh, from um, uh, voodoo or, or voodoo, where you're you're bringing some sort of spirit into your body and then you're getting some characteristics and abilities from that. That's kind of cool. Like I, I think if you built a character around that idea, that might be quite neat. 
So that's what's in the Demon Lord's Companion 2. Uh, there's some neat, uh, really neat ideas that go beyond just the traditional simulation of, uh, uh, of fantasy tropes, or fantasy role-playing tropes at least. Next up, Exquisite Agony. Now this is the book that's all about hell and hell's Lord Diabolus. And I love this book. I think this has got a lot of cool stuff in it. Uh, in particular, well, I mean, I, mean, um, I, I normally play uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord, so as a player, uh, maybe not quite as much cool stuff, but uh, as a DM, there certainly is some really great stuff. Great ideas about, uh, uh, great information about what hell is like in the Shadow of the Demon Lord uh, setting, uh, where Diabolus fits in, and where his various um, his various minions sort of fit into the, this, the cosmology. Uh, gives you some good rules on summoning devils. And devils in this game, just like in Dungeons and Dragons, devils are different from demons. There's another book we're going to talk about that uh, deals with that stuff. But this is the chart that I was talking about, about the infernal gifts. And while the Cenobite sort of got around the that in um, uh, in the, the current campaign I'm running, in my first campaign, I made a lot of great use out of this. And to be honest, actually, one of the other players in the campaign is playing a tiefling, which is a reskinned version of a cambion, which is sort of a half demon uh, character or ancestry, a character race uh, that you can play that's that's introduced in this game. Um, the Infernal Gifts is, is great. It's not just flat stat bonuses. It's things like gain money, you know, gain between one gold crown to 10,000 gold crowns, uh, learn a new language, gain a swimmer or flyer ability your character suddenly grows you know uh, demonic wings uh you learn spells and that's what i've gotten in uh, a previous campaign i ran for this i use that as a, as a sort of a, the carrot to draw one of my player characters down the dark path is because i get the player like why would you not want a higher level spell than what you can cast like come on give it to me and uh unfortunately that came along with a lot of corruption and uh and this is so that this was provided for me a lot of really great story fodder. And um, if your players are really into the system as well too, I think there's some great collaborative story elements you could introduce uh, you know, using the stuff. Uh, then they give you some random tables for uh, di uh, diabol sorry, diabolical object properties. And Shadow of the Demon Lord really uh, does a great job of providing tons of cool random table stuff in it. It has a very uh, OSR kind of or old school game kind of feel to it both in the core book and all these extra books as well. It introduces some new uh, uh, relics, and the relics are interesting in this. They're just like rife with corruption, so I, I wouldn't, for myself, the games I've run so far with it, I would not really want to use those because it's going to corrupt a character pretty quickly, but it does provide some good um, reference points to create your own uh, relics, to figure out what would be, you know, what's balanced, what isn't balanced, what's, what's expected of it. Uh, then it expands the bestiary quite a bit with a, just a ton of very cool uh, monsters, including things like gargoyles and ifrits and angels, uh, chimeras. And I love the picture of the chimera. It's badass. And as with most monsters in Shadow of the Demon Lord, they're really great. Like All of them have interesting things to do in combat. So it's not just... The game is um, is not to the level of like crunch or mechanical complexity as like a game like Pathfinder, but it certainly is more complicated than like basic D and D, you know, uh, and this does a good job of it. Like I think all the monsters that are in here are, have interesting, uh, things they can do. And, and even just gives you great ideas for, you know, reskinning or for creating your own monsters, uh, for, you know, uh, for throwing against your players. It uh, gives you an adventure in here, which I, I read, but I really don't remember anything about, so I, I can't speak to whether that's good or not. And then it gives you the Cambion, which is the um, half demon, or sorry, half devil uh, version of the of the character, and it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I uh, used that as the sort of the uh, framework for running the, or coming up with a tiefling, like the tiefling uh, race from uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, then it introduces a new, there is a new expert path called apostate. And I think it's sort of like the, I shouldn't say, I really don't remember what it is. Uh, what, are, what are they? I'm not gonna read it now, but anyway, there's, there's some more diabolic sort of influenced um, or flavored paths in here, both expert paths and, and uh, master paths. Gives you a bunch of new spells that have a very, 
hellish sort of uh, flavor to it. And that's what you get in Exquisite Agony. Um, next up is Terrible Beauty. Terrible Beauty is the book that is all about uh, elves and the Fae. And of the products I've got here, this is one of my favorites as well, too. I really love this stuff. My first campaign uh, that I, I ran for Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, we followed the sort of suggested uh, method of randomly generating what the influence of the Shadow of the Demon Lord was, like how that was manifesting in our campaign world. And we happened to roll one that was that the Fae had gone wild, like the wild hunt had gone corrupted and, and was, you know, things that were mischievous and, and um, uh, sort of tricksters before were now murderous and uh, evil. And this supplement gave me some really, really great ideas of, of how the Fae are supposed to play in this. And uh, in the past, to be honest, like I've never really liked Fae creatures. Like I've never, in, in no role playing game have I thought, oh, I really need to have brownies or I really need to have leprechauns or some stuff like that. This is the first game that I've ever found it a really compelling adversary. And uh, this book has a ton of really great stuff in there. It also importantly introduces two uh, really important ancestries that, that players can play, including elves. Now, elves in this are very different from your traditional Tolkien-esque sort of, you know, benevolent demigod type things. They are, or they can be uh, totally alien, and um, they are really unusual. They all, they all have sort of a, a very fey, um, unnatural characteristic to them. In the campaign that I played in, one of my fellow players played a horrifically alien character or uh, elf. The because this elf was an immortal, lived soul, and blah blah blah, did not care about mortals really one whit. And at the culmination of that campaign, uh, he actually managed to use this, like the sort of MacGuffin from our campaign, to wipe out uh, every mortal who ever wronged a fae. Uh, so in a campaign world that has a lot of fey in it, um, that's, that's a lot of dead people. And I think that's, that's very fitting. He played the character totally the way that the elves are, are written in here. They do not have a concern for, for mortal races. Um, but for, if you're using Shadow of the Demon Lord for a, uh, reskinned world, this is also almost perfectly serviceable. The only thing I took out from mine is, uh, Iron vulnerability is something that is is signature to all fae descended races in Shadow of the Demon Lord, including the goblins, the changeling, the elf, the hobgoblins. Um, I don't think the fawns do, but I can't remember. Um, but anyway, that's something that isn't present in D and D, so I, I didn't include that. But it's otherwise the stats are totally totally serviceable as that. Uh, then you got the hobgoblins, which are sort of like the. Um, they're they're all look the same like they're it's the neat thing with the hobgoblins is that they're effectively a race of of fairy clones they all look identical uh, and yeah i don't know i mean they're, they're kind of they're kind of neat if you want something different oh yeah and the pixies are in here as well too so if you wanted to play a pixie character uh they have stats in here and the stats are totally for the pixie ancestry are totally you know serviceable they're, they're not uh, going to break the game uh, i don't know if um I wouldn't play a pixie just because it's not a character that I can really wrap my head around, even though it's probably the best presentation of pixies, uh, short of the um, maybe uh, changeling the dreaming. But uh, if that is your bag, then it's there for you. To give you some good uh, excerpt paths, the avowed, so the fairy don't, because in the default Shadow of the Demon Lord world, the fairy don't worship gods because of the way gods are effectively like super powerful fae who have been, by the worship of mortals, have transitioned into sort of godhood. So because of that, knowing that it's just like really powerful versions of themselves, they really don't worship the gods per se, but they, they have avowed who worship other powerful fae, like the fairy queen or the goblin king or, or things like that. Uh, so that's the expert path for that. And there's some other master paths that are very uh, appropriate for fae, like beguiler or eternal guardian or harbinger. Or one of the cool ones I saw in the game I played in, the Morrigan, which is sort of like a avenging spirit of the Fae. It's a very neat uh, uh, expert path. Introduces some new magic, including the Fae tradition, which is a uh, I've had a couple players use in uh, different campaigns, and it's a very, a very effective um, uh, tradition. Lots of really cool enchantment uh, spells from that. 
And then there's a whole section that deals with the, the actual Fey realms themselves, what you find there, some great random uh, tables as well, too. Uh, and then you got your bestiary, which introduces a bunch of cool and interesting uh, fey creatures, including things like the Banshee, uh, the Bean Me, I may be pronouncing that wrong, some powerful elves or elves in here, like the Elf uh, Knight Errant, Fawns, Kobolds, and the Jabberwock, which is sort of like the most powerful creature that's in here. So the Jabberwock is in there. And I love this picture too, the Marrow, but your, your underwater uh, ogre type thing. I love that picture. I think it's super cool. I don't think I've actually used a marrow yet, which means I need to incorporate one in my next campaign. And then as with most of the sort of um, spot books for the different um, themes, there is another adventure at the end of this. And I really can't remember how good the adventure is or not. So, but it's in there. So if you need to spring, you know, uh, springboard your uh, imagination, they've, they've got that in there for you to pick up and, and run or reskin if you need. Next up is Uncertain Faith. This is the priest book. This is the priest splat book for uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. What it does is it expands the priest novice class into a bunch of different specialized ones for every one of the fates that are in the Shadow of the Demon Lord setting. So uh, what this book does is it goes through and gives you extensive detail about all the different fates and gods and uh, pantheons that occupy the Shadow of the Demon Lord world. And then it gives you new expert paths for each of the different gods, just like specialty priests kind of in uh, second edition Dungeons and Dragons. And these are great. Like they're really, uh, they f the powers that you get from it, they feel balanced and they feel totally thematic. Uh, and then each of the sections gives you some great ideas for what the priesthoods are like, what their holy practices are and things like that, or unholy as the case may be. There's some interesting rules for the, um, the interference of gods in your world, like the manifestation of divine presence or presences. I don't know if I got that correct <laughs> uh, plural. Uh, and there's a bunch of new spells that are in here, which are great. Uh, so, and they're not necessarily any one or another uh, tradition. They're they're from all over. Just like every one of these things, what they do, uh, there are a couple of these expansions or the splat books that uh, introduce brand new traditions so you've got a whole new traditions to in mind but a lot of these what they just do is they just add a bunch of uh spells to existing traditions and the core rule book i think has 330 spells in it so there's a lot to choose from there uh, but there's just an a you know an abundance of riches that you get from these um supplements and then this introduces again a bunch of adversaries that you can add to your game and then there is an adventure at the end. And this adventure, again, I, I don't really remember it. So I can't tell you whether it's a great one or not great one, but uh, most of them are, at the very least, what it provides you is an idea of what, you know, what the author thought you would do with the game world or with the material in the book and uh, how to balance the, um, the adversaries. Uh, next up is another of my absolute favorites. It's A Glorious Death. Now, this book is all about the far south where the Jotun, the Jotun are kind of like the small giants, like sort of like half giants maybe, or like small size uh, frost giants from D&D. Uh, &D. Uh, and I love this book because the character that I played from level zero to level 10 was a Jotun, and I just loved him, and I loved playing him. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons why I really loved it is because the way that the Shadow of the Demon Lord game uh, reinforces the idea of size in uh, in a mechanical basis is by you know if you're bigger and you're trying to force your strength on someone else in addition to likely having a higher strength which is going to be added to your d20 roll you also get an advantage you get or an advantage you get a boom on your roll so you're always going to be more likely to succeed against something that's smaller than you and that's just great i mean it, it, it gives a nice little mechanical oomph every time my guy tried to toss around some smaller human or you know elf or whatever it, it was almost always a guarantee that he you know wahoo they go flying over so that's really great it's also neat because the jotun are one of the few uh like powerful ancestries where it subsumes the role that an expert path would do. So you don't end up picking an expert path. You end up picking your ancestry, which will give you stuff at levels uh, zero, uh, one, two, 
what is it? Uh, not your extra, I'm sorry, your novice path. It replaces the novice path. So you do one, two, four, and six. Uh, so you end up getting a bunch of uh, things from your ancestry. But even then, you get some options to, to customize it. Like if you're playing a character who's more of a martial Jotun, at some of those levels, you'll be able to pick weapon related stuff. Uh, if you are playing more of a caster type, you'll be able to pick a spell, which is what you normally would get at the equivalent level in your novice path. So even though it is a very powerful ancestry, and I'll let you see that really great picture of the Jotun there, uh, it uh, it still gives you a, a great deal of um, opportunity to, to customize your character. This one introduces some new paths that are very thematic for the uh, Jotun, including the Juggernaut, which is just basically an unstoppable uh, powerhouse, uh, the Cryomancer, the Seer, and the Scald. And actually, Scald, sorry, Scald is a master path, and so is Seer. I actually played a Scald. My guy ended up being a Scald, so he was a sort of like, I picked um, Ranger as my expert path, and then I picked uh, Scald. So it was sort of like a, I, I joked that he was like a dark version of Tom Bombadil, uh, but uh, Scald has a very Nordic kind of uh, flavor to it, so that's cool. And then Warrior Spirit as well, as a master path. Uh, and then it gives you a bunch of Jotun flavored magic, which is great. And then a bunch of description. This is your uh, gazetteer or gazetteer, depending on how you pronounce it. The frozen wasteland. So these are the lands where the Jotun live and where the um, armies of the Empire in Shadow of the Demon Lord invaded to capture the Jotun, bring them back, magically alter them, and give birth to the orc race that uh, became slave armies for the and slave laborers. For the empire so and then there is a bunch of very cool sort of uh nordic flavored or norse flavored um, mythical elements that are introduced here and um, relics that are appropriate to the jotun uh, and then you get your monster section as well too which gives you some great stuff you can throw at your players like the um where are they the uh, Draugr, I think, are in here as well, too, which are like the Drowned Dead. And that's just an, a Viking um, spirit like a, a, that I, I love. It gives you some new rules for ancient dragons, which are the most powerful adversaries that you will find in this uh, role-playing game. Rules for the Kraken. And uh, rules for the Inheriar. The Inheriar are like the Honored Dead that come from Valhalla. So you got some cool opportunities to bring that in. Uh, Valkyries are in here as well, and then there's some rules, and then there is an adventure. Now, this adventure is, I've actually, I've not run it, but I have read it quite a bit. The adventure is bonkers tough. Like, it starts off, it's supposed to be a, a master path adventure, but it starts off with you fighting that type of ancient dragon that I mentioned, like the most powerful thing in the game. And if you're level seven going against that, I don't know how mechanically you could conceivably beat the dragon. Like, it's just an unbelievably difficult opponent. So I haven't run the adventure, so I don't know how it plays at the table, but it reads like you're going to all die in one of the opening scenes. Like, it's just, it's crazy. Um, next up, uh, I'll stick to sort of the original uh, Shadow of the Lord stuff before I go into the uh, other world things, is the Tombs of Desolation. And the Tomb of Desolation is sort of like the undead book for Shadow of the Demon Lord. Uh, in the default setting for Shadow of the Demon Lord, the very southern end of the campaign sort of setting is where the wastes are, and then far to the north is the desolation, which is this like scorched uh, and desolate uh, land of uh, uh, sand and you know rocky barrens and and whatnot, and it's the ruins of this ancient civilization that was there before the current race of man came in. This evil and twisted uh, race of uh, humans. And what the sort of the, you know, the, se the setting uh, or the setup in the setting is that these wastes just spawn tons and tons of undead that slowly make their way down. So there's this like, you know, um, line of keeps that are up there ma manned by uh, worshipers of the new god who just fight these undead hordes, kind of like the, you know, the wall in um, uh, uh, Westeros. Uh, so what this has for you is a bunch of new ancestries as well, too, including a revenant. And what a revenant is, is a risen dead from another uh, class. Now, the revenant has seen a lot of play in my game because 
uh, when we originally f first started playing Shadow of the Demon Lord, we made the decision that we were going to play it as written. It seemed like a really deadly game. Uh, it's a horror game, so it's not just a D and D thing where like you're oh yes got saved at last minute. We wanted to play it and just let the dice fall where they may. And sure enough, one of the player characters died in the opening adventure. But I loved that. That was around the time when I got this, and I loved the idea of the Revenant. So we had him come back, and then he died again and again and again and again. And it's cool because every time the character comes back as a Revenant, you are slowly accumulating more and more insanity as your character is gradually losing their humanity and their mind because of the progressive deaths. So I, I like that a lot, and um, it's cool that it gives you a way to story-wise keep playing that character beyond just uh, you know a death. And there's a salamander, which is like a uh, kind of like a it's like a genie descended uh, character with a fiery kind of flavor. And the vampires for those of you who really can't wait to mash up your you know vampire the masquerade with uh, some D and D, this will be a suitable supplement to you. Uh, you you know, the vampires have blood pools and so forth. They have to avoid the sunlight and, and whatnot. Uh, but it's it's presented in a way that is balanced with the other ancestries. So you're not going to be playing a character who is ungodly, unbalanced compared to all the rest of the characters. So so that's pretty cool. Um, and that's actually something that is really great about the game in general. I'm not going to talk about some of the smaller supplements that are available for it. But uh, if you go to drive through RPG and you browse your way uh, around the uh, section or the, the, the library of, of books, some of the smaller supplements include things like playable centaurs or playable lycanthropes or um, expanded rules for designing your clockworks or playing gnomes. You know, um, those first two in particular uh, are, I mean, they're, they're not characters that you would think would be easily modeled at uh, where you could both play them at low levels, but they would feel like a centaur, they would feel like a werewolf or a weird tiger or whatever the hell you want to play. But the rules do a really, really good job of letting that ancestry feel like the thing it's supposed to be without, you know, making a character who's ungodly powerful compared to the rest of the player characters. And the vampires is another example of that. So it's another real strength of the system and a real uh, credit to Robert Schwab to be able to, you know, incorporate so many great ideas without breaking the game. Then there are some new paths in here, and, and a lot of these are very undead oriented, and one is particularly suited to the vampires. So if you want to become the, you know, your uh, airsats uh, Vlad Dracula, there is an expert path for doing that. Uh, there's a bunch of new spells in here as well that all have sort of a necromantic flavor to it. There's the Gazetteer for desolation to give you an idea of what it's like exploring there. Gives you some rules for weather and the sort of uh, environmental conditions that you find in uh, deserts. It gives you some adventures. Uh, sorry, it does not. It gives you some adventure ideas because th with this was one of the first setting books published for it. And at that time, what they were doing is doing a setting book and then also an adventure book at the same time. They abandoned that, that sort of structure very quickly. But um, what it does include is just a buck ton of great other monsters, including the Death Lord, which is effectively like the Lich. And I have fought one of these in the game, and they fucking suck. <laughs> like, they are so dangerous, and they're so scary to fight uh, that it's just awesome. It, it's one of the most terrifying combat encounters I've ever had in any role-playing game. And uh, it was great. Like, it, it, it's a real... It's a credit to my, my dungeon master as well, too, my buddy Jared Rasher. Uh, so, hi, Jared, if you're listening. Uh, but it's also th uh, mechanically a really great adversary. Um, what else does it include here? It's giant scorpions for your desert kind of homes. Uh, Lamia is a really interesting demon thing. If your characters want to fight that, kind of like a, um, I can't remember what it's called in uh, the demon in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Mummies. What else is in here? Severed hands, skeletal steeds, and a whisper cactus. So if you want an enemy cactus, this is absolutely the book for you. And then at the end, there is another adventure which involves exploring. A pyramid, and as with the other adventures, I really can't speak to the quality of it, so forgive me. Uh, next up is The Hunger in the Void. This is the book that tells you all about the Demon Lord. And uh, <clears throat> as with the, um, what do you call it? What is it called? The Hell's One, uh, Infernal or Exquisite Agony. This one provides just a ton of great information 
about the demon lord. So uh, some additional ways to sort of expand on the shadow of the demon lord, like the ways that the demon lord's presence manifests in your campaign world, it gives you a bunch of extra ideas and options for that. And like, check that out. That is, that does not look good. If you really want to lean more heavily into sort of cosmic and uh, body horror stuff for your Shadow of the Demon Lord game, tons of great stuff for that in here. Um, gives some different organizations that sort of follow or worship the Demon Lord. So that's all great stuff. Great rules for mutations. If you want to play mutated uh, demon spawn, you've got plenty of rules for that in here. Then there's your bestiary which is a little more expanded in here because there's a little more information about the different adversaries in here. Like this first section deals with cults of the, of the demon Lord or different cults. And then it gives you some stats to work from as well. Look at this horrible thing too. Like Jesus, that is nightmare fuel right there. And so there's plenty of horrific things. If you really want to play up that, uh, the more, you know, Lovecraftian or body horror, like um, Cronenberg-esque elements of uh, horror. There's just a ton of great ideas or a bunch of great ideas in here. New magic uh, for either you or the adversaries to use. Great expanded rules on the Beastmen. In this cam uh, campaign setting, the Beastmen are another of the uh, followers of the Demon Lord. And this gives you some uh, a ton of new Beastmen to throw at your, adver at your um, uh, players. Uh, and then it gives you some, I mean, I don't know, I, sh I wouldn't ever want to play a, a campaign where I'm playing the Beastmen from this setting, but if that's your thing, uh, there's tons of rules for creating the different kinds of Beastmen that are in here. And one handy thing with these is that you can very easily reskin these things to make them other kinds of um, other ancestries that you would find in other fantasy games. So for instance, I used the warg, which are kind of like the jackal men or like knoll type character, uh, uh, beast men. I used that as the rough stat for my minotaurs uh, because when I converted my fourth edition D&D campaign over to Shadow of the Demon Lord, I used that as the, as the, um, the guide point to how, how to, you know, stat that out. Um, but you can play things like bugbears and all the bugbear in this, that is the bugbear. They're these terrifying things that steal and eat children. So they're just fucking horrible. They look, I love how, nope, my camera's not working with me. Uh, so this is one of my favorite illustrations in the game. There he is, look at that. Those red eyes. Oh, dang. I need to throw a bugbear in my game, next game. Um, then there are expanded rules on demons. So a bunch of different ways to make the demons feel more unique. And... If you're not familiar with the Shadow of the Demon Lord core book, the core book already has a shit ton of ways to make the, each demon feel very, very unique, both mechanically and also like its slate of abilities and slate of spells uh, and how it looks. Then there are expanded rules for creating demons. And uh, this like goes right down to the, like, the, the basic form of the demon. So does it have carapace? Is it centauroid? Is it uh, a crawler? Is it a geometric, excuse me, shape? Is it a polyp? Is it a um, serpentine thing? So, you know, you can randomly generate some really trippy looking things with a full slate of different abilities that it can access. Like, look at that. That's random tables you can do to put together your, your, uh, your own custom, you know, weirdo thing to throw at your, at your allies. And I will give a shout out as well, too, that there are a bunch of, I can't remember what they call them, but a bunch of the smaller supplements for Shadow of the Demon Lord uh, in, basically are very much things like this, but for different kinds of monsters. So like there's one that's on dragons. That's really awesome. Uh, and gives rules for like, you know, draconic races and uh, drakes as well as dragons. So it's useful at all different levels of play. Uh, there's a similar one on monsters as well, too. That's, that's sort of, you know, if you want to make stats for like griffins or hippogriffs or whatever, those stats are in the core book. But if you want to customize them yourself, some of those smaller, cheaper supplements give you a ton of great things to work from. Uh, as well. Then we go into the demon princes, who are sort of like the uh, uh, the generals for the demon lord. And like, there's more very, very atmospheric art. Look at the little people down there performing or um, praying to this uh, hideous thing. And then there are secrets of the void. And this is where they sort of start introducing what's out there in the void. And 
one of the first interesting things they introduce is a very modern day looking guy floating away in this bubble here with jeans that are all torn and a cigarette or cigar in his, uh, in his mouth. And they talk about how this could be structured or connected with other worlds. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's a cool way of, of introducing an idea of a multiverse. And the next supplement is one of those multiversal places you can go. This is Godless. Now this is, I, I'm hoping at the time of recording, I'm hoping this is only the first of these types of products we're gonna see. But this is effectively like if you want to play Shadow the Demon Lord in kind of a Mad Max or like post-apocalyptic or um, is it Enter the Badlands? I don't remember. What, there's an AMC show that that is is a sort of post-apocalyptic thing too. This is the supplement that lets you do that stuff. It's it's very much like kind of like a much much darker version of Gamma World. Um, it's not quite as as uh, sci-fi-ish as what Gamma World is because the idea is is that the shadow of the demon lord has fallen on a modern world and i think the recommendation if i recall is that you use your own hometown as the as a setting for this but everything that's in here is very much keyed towards making characters like how to modify the basic rules to play in that setting i'm not going to talk about the setting too much just because to be honest it doesn't really grab me like if i wanted to run something like this i, I there are probably other games that I would prefer to use for it, like uh, Mutant Zero or, or something something that is really designed to simulate that uh, and play up that like survival kind of element. But what there is in here that I really love is lots of great rules for, um, for modern day stuff. So, you know, firearms, um, vehicles, there's some great rules like Craft Bullet that are in here too, some good new uh, Master Paths, including Gunslinger, and some fun uh, expert paths like Raider or Preacher or Road Warrior, which are really neat. A uh, bunch of new modern day weapons. So like that runs the gamut from a grenade launcher to a machine gun to pistol, revolver, stuff like that. That's all good. Um, rules for like explosives are in here, laser sights. Uh, and then some modern day gear and then a good selection of vehicles in here as well which i really like so that runs from like a dirt bike to a helicopter to an interceptor to a limousine to a sports car and there are rules for customizing your vehicles as well too for giving them extras or add-ons and uh so if you really want to make you know some very mad Maxine kind of stuff there are great rules for that in here the Rules for vehicle combat that they include in here, I believe, are duplicates from the companion. And to be honest, it um, I haven't used them as written because they feel a little too mechanical. Like there's, you know, you're sort of tracking like the turn radius and, and stuff like that. And um, it's a little more detailed than I really want to have in my exciting chase stuff. But the game... Still, because the, the raw me the mechanic that that uh, comes with the game is so easily changed and and you know modified to whatever you want it that it's very very easily very easy to just use those stats and uh, and run it in a more narrative way if you want to uh, and there are also this is something also I really like there are rules for um, different uses of firearms so like um, burst fire full auto fire double tap which I think is is cool because I mean the um, firearms that are in the uh, core book are not particularly advanced so you really wouldn't be you know fan of the hammers or stuff like that but the material that's in here gives you more than enough stuff to play like say a deadlands type game but using shadow of the demon lord which is awesome like that would be a great great game um i can all i've also used this as the um some of the fundamentals not the fundamental some of the uh primary source that i was using when i was trying to convert uh, the Iron Gods Adventure Path from Pathfinder. It's a very science fantasy kind of thing. And there's tons and tons of material in here that's really helpful for that too. I also used in my campaign, when one player ended up having his uh, character die, I wanted to give him something very, very different and very unique. So uh, one of his characters was actually a magician from a modern day world who ended up getting sucked through to because of story. Uh, to this, um, to the the default setting for Shadow of the Demon Lord Earth, the URTH, and he had a magical Dodge Challenger or Charger. 
I don't remember which one it was. I'm not a car guy. So um, some kind of really cool looking muscle car that could travel through, you know, uh, it could like effectively teleport across long distances. So it had that kind of like DeLorean from Back to the Future feel to it. He had a six shooter that was uh, on him and uh, it all felt very balanced. Like the character did not feel like uh, overpowered or whatever. So again, it's a, it's a real credit to uh, Mr. Schwab that he introduced a bunch of really great modern day or uh, you know post-apocalyptic kind of ideas, but it still all works within the same system. And then there's a whole section on how to destroy your world for some of the threats that you would see in a post-apocalyptic world like radiation and um, how you change some of the elements of the Shadow of the Demon Lord setting, like the Hidden Kingdoms. Hidden Kingdoms are effectively kind of like, you know, demi-planes in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and then some relics from the post-apocalyptic world, like the Savage Boomerang, if you're a big fan of um, Mad Max, uh, or whatever the second one is, World Warrior, I don't remember. And then there are some new adversaries, including giant killer roaches with shotguns, which is very cool. Uh, I haven't used these guys yet, the Inheritors, but I, I kind of like them. And then, yeah, just a, a bunch of other things you might find in the, um, you know, in the wastes, like cyborgs or mutants or, or whatever. So while I wouldn't necessarily run a game set in Godless, I really love this supplement for the uh, for the material that's in it, for the, the rules material that's in it. I think it's very easily repurposed. So the last two things I'm going to talk about are the... Again, two supplements that I think, uh, in, a, in a way similar to what was intended with the Shadow, Demon Lord's Companion 2, where it sort of introduces some new ideas, these things introduced a bunch of really interesting new elements to the game that really changed the, the feel for it. One of them is Forbidden Rules. And Forbidden Rules is, uh, gosh, like this might be my favorite product for Shadow of the Demon Lord. I really love a lot of the other ones that I've talked about, but what this is is just a compilation of optional rules to tweak the rules of Shadow of the Demon Lord to fit more the way you want to play. And while the, the rules as written are terrific, it's great to have these uh, nice little options to tweak the uh, the rules. Um, so these things include things like changing over to like 3D6 instead of using 1D20. If you really want to see a you know predictable uh, probability curve with your game, you can do that. Uh, there's information in here as to why you shouldn't do that or why it uh, leans it, it doesn't um, fit quite with what the uh, design aesthetic of the game is but uh, it, it's still completely supported optional rules for critical uh, critical success and critical failure the game at default does not have uh, uh, rules for you know default rules for when everybody rolls a 20 or when everybody rolls a one uh, there are introduced rules for fortune points and fortune points are or sorry, new rules for fortune points. Fortune points in Shadow of the Demon Lord are kind of like hero points or action points or you know inspiration from uh, D&D 5th. They're the things that uh, the players can use to interfere or to um, modify the vagaries of the dice rolls. And this gives you some great other options that I use in my game now. I, I play my Shadow of the Demon Lord game more of a you know pulpy kind of adventure thing rather than a strict like realistic horror kind of uh you know i don't know horror game the way that the the default game plays so some of the options in here like you know healing damage or acting on someone else's turn or turning a success into failure or of this isn't an option that's in here or avoiding death you know i use i let my players use that uh, as a way of getting around it because the game can be very very lethal in particular if they make poor tactical choices sometimes like you know the mage or the spellcaster running forward so that's some great stuff there's rules for using damage reducing armor if you don't like the idea of um defense being effectively like an armor class kind of thing there's rules for, for changing that there are rules for uh some optional damage rules for like instead if you don't like the idea of just people stacking up a bunch of uh hit point damage effectively and then you know finally going down there's rules for running the game differently uh there are expanded rules for social combat and i love these uh, i think these are great uh, if you want to have you want to make a like mini game out of some of your social interactions this is a way to you know expand that into more of a game than just like one dice roll or you know whatever or, or two dice rolls or contested rules 
Um, there's options for changing combat in here. And this is abstract combat. So oh, there's new actions in here as well too that I really love. Uh, there's one in particular, uh, Goad, which is basically like your taunting one uh, adversary to attack you and they'll get a boon when they attack you, but they'll get a bane if they attack anybody else. I think that's the way it works. Yeah, that's right. And it's great. It's sort of like if you're playing a tank type character, which I was when I played, it gives you an opportunity to sort of get that thing, the big scary monster, like say the Lich, to focus fire on you or you're giving a benefit to your allies because you're affecting the target's chance of, of hitting them. So I love that. Um, and then there's things like wrestle and overbear. I used overbear quite a bit as a, a yoke to push people into things like, you know, downstairs or into fire pits or things like that. So that's really cool. Then there's the abstract of combat. And I've actually, I, when I played Shadow of the Demon Lord, and since I've been running it the last year or so, I use this. You, It's sort of, to be honest, it's very similar to the abstracted um, range stuff that I see in Conan, in Modiphius's Conan game. It reads almost identical to that where there's different zones and like you can use an action to move from one zone to another zone. And it really facilitates very much faster tactical play while still giving players some interesting tactical options to, to decide. And I think it, it uh, even if you're using a map, it lets the player have a little bit more theater of the mind experience than just, you know, moving a character along X number of squares. So I, I really do like those rules an awful lot. Uh, there are... Optional rules for character creation, if you want to randomize your stats, it introduces a new path that's called the Adept. And the Adept is kind of like a, I, I, I misread it or misunderstood it the first couple times I read it. I read it to be more of like a psychic class. Like if you want to play a spellcaster, but you don't want to be a, um, a magician or a priest, then that's the one you pick. But really what it is, is sort of like a, a watered down kind of like, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, warrior mage, uh, and it's it's okay. Uh, I, I think that it's when you compare it apples to apples to the options that a priest gets and the options that a mage get or a magician gets, it's it's definitely the lesser of the options. Uh, in particular, because there are some extra uh, new options to pick for your priests or for your magicians, which are effectively the same ability that the the uh, adept gets. Um, now, just so you know, the one thing they get in this is that when uh, basically almost every other novice class gets some ability at a very low level, one or two, to be able to add a boon to their attack rolls. Um, the warriors get this as combat prowess, I think it's called. The um, rogues get this as trickery, and the priests get it as um, inspiration, I think it's called. I can't, I can't remember. There's an ability where basically it's, they help your god, their god helps you hit more often. The main magician was the only class that didn't have that feature. So the, the adept gets something like that at level two. It's called potent spellcasting. But then the optional rules let you swap out what a priest or what a magician gets at that level for this ability. So if you're using an optional ability, if your real concern is that I'm not getting a boon on my attack roll, whereas the, the adept does, you can get that as a magician and still get all the other benefits that you get as a magician. It's not useless. Like I, I, there's one player who, uh, in my current campaign, has been playing an adept, and it's okay. But the, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a. It, it, when compared to the other options for novice uh, paths, it's it's not quite as uh, doesn't hold up as well. There are rules then for simplified weapons, uh, and then one of my favorite rules, which is uh, power points. Now, one of the uh, things that I had mentioned in my review was that I, I didn't like in the default rules the way that you know how many spells you can cast per day is that it you know it's a function of what you, uh, rank your power stat is your power is like how you know potent of a spell caster you are you look in that and then you compare it on a chart and it tells you how many times you can cast each of the spells you know per day so you would track each individual spell how many times you can cast it per day which to me felt like very much like the kind of uh, Vancian like memorization stuff. So I really wanted to have a, ma a mana fuel thing that gave more flexibility. And that's what the system is. And it's great. The thing I ignored, because I'm a fucking dummy, and I don't, well, not I'm a dummy, I'm a know-it-all. So I thought, nah, I don't need that thing. Is that there's a limit on casting that is included with this optional rules. And what it is, is that you can... For each of your spells, you can only cast a number of spells of a certain rank equal to one plus the number of spells you've learned at that rank. 
So if you've got a rank four spell, which is a really powerful spell, like that's like a rank or a level eight spell in D and D, really potent, almost end game spell. You only, if you only know one of those, you can only cast that twice. If you only know two of them, you can only cast them three times. I have not been applying that restriction. So what I'm saying is my players are just spamming their most powerful spell over and over and over because some of the, uh, in particular, the wizard expert path just gives you an ungodly amount of mana. And to give you a sense of, of what it is, to cast one of the spells, it costs them an amount of mana equal to the rank of the spell plus one. That's the, the optional rules here for power points. I call it mana, but same thing. The sort of cast a max level spell, a fifth level spell only costs you six mana. My player who has a seventh level uh, magician wizard has over a hundred power points. And then I also foolishly at lower levels introduced an optional rule so they could use healing potions to help restore mana. Healing potions are super fucking cheap and even restoring a quarter of their mana still is a huge benefit. So basically what my player could do is squeeze out, you know, with a hundred plus mana, at least a hundred mana, he can cast his highest ranked spells, so the equivalent of like, you know, rank, uh, level nine spells from D&D. Uh, they're not quite that powerful, to be honest. I mean, like magic doesn't get quite that that crazy in this. But even then, fifth level spells, he could drink a healing potion and suddenly get uh, four more uses out of that spell. So if you elect to use these optional rules, which I think are really great, I would highly recommend that you do not do what I do and follow the recommendation for limits on the number of times you can uh, cast them per day. So uh, that, that is something uh, I would, um, yeah maybe read it and, and apply it and don't do what I did. Um, anyway, then what you get is a bunch of modifies uh, modifications for the different uh, expert paths for how that, um, for all the spellcasting ones that, that are modified, or that modify the amount of spells you have, it gives you how that works in the context of the uh, PowerPoint system. Uh, then it expands on downtime quite a bit, which are, is really great. And then it gives you some um, rules to work from for playing the game beyond 10th level. Now, from what I've read online, this is not what, when we do finally get official rules for playing you know, levels 11 to whatever, this is probably not what they're gonna look like. Because uh, it sounds like, uh, now I haven't read anything directly from Robert Schwab, so I don't know if that's, that's accurate, but what everyone else uh, I've read, they seem to suggest that uh, Mr. Schwab is gonna be walking, his, uh, walking us away from this kind of idea. But, if you're playing the game and you love playing the game, and it's a great game, like I really cannot say enough you know, good things about Shadow of the Demon Lord. If you hit level 10 and you don't want to stop playing those characters, there's some terrific roles in here for, for continuing on. And because the game is so well balanced too, it doesn't feel like when I've done the math in my head of where the players would be, you know, at level 20, at level 30, it really doesn't feel that it, you could break the game. So the characters will be appropriately, epically powerful but the system itself won't break down. And I've seen in a number of other games that I've run where I hit a certain point, like Iron Gods, uh, sorry, sorry, Iron Gods, the Iron Kingdoms role-playing game and the Star Wars role-playing game, the Fantasy Flight ones, those two games a, uh, basically age themselves out of playability. I, I feel that at high XP, both of those games do not function anymore. Uh, they, they, You cannot play the games as written. You have to start changing the rules fudging things and so forth to make it work still that does not seem to be the case with this game so that's a, a um uh i mean a, another reason why i think this is a a really 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 great supplement there's just so much terrific stuff and like look at the size of this thing too there's it's such a slim volume but there's so much great stuff in there so if um yeah i mean i think that if what you as an initial product. I said at the outset of this review, as an initial first step beyond the core rulebook, that the Demon Lord's Companion is a really, really good option. I would suggest that this might be, if you really want to, you know, tweak the way the game plays, this is a great second purchase. And I think it's quite cheap as well, too, relatively speaking. Um, the final book I want to talk about is something that was kickstarted. It was, I think the last Kickstarter we saw for Shadow of the Demon Lord, and that is the Freeport Companion. Now, I have, have not been particularly familiar with Freeport. I've been aware of Freeport since the first adventure came out, whatever it was, Death in Freeport or 
something in Freeport. I don't know. Um, but it never really, you know, uh, it never really caught my eye in comparison to the, you know, the other things that were available. I was never really that I didn't care about a, playing a pirate, you know, city thing, but it has, you know, endured for a long, long time. It was the first uh, adventure path that was published for third edition D&D as part of the open game license. Uh, Robert Schwab has worked on uh, uh, Freeport as well, which um, if he finds it cool, then maybe I need to take a closer look. But what this is, is basically all the rules you need to play in Freeport with Shadow the Demon Lord. Uh, this supplement places the city of Freeport into this, the framework or the setting of Shadow the Demon Lord. But um, you're, if you like the idea instead of playing, you know, the whatever, wherever you've set Freeport elsewhere, you can, um, you can just do that. And they give you rules for modifying things like, like or modifying the rules to incorporate things like half elves or D and D style elves, elves rather than the sort of you know um, the shadow of the demon lord style ones. Now, one thing I, I will say: this is all the rules. This is not a setting guide. If you want to play uh, in Freeport and you want to set your game there, then you're going to need to pick up something else as well. Which one second, I'll show you. Oop. So this is something that is specific to Pathfinder, but includes all the setting material that's in the setting free book for it. But you'll need something like this as well, which gives you all the maps and all the you know setting information, all the people you find on the different corners and so forth. But in terms of the rules, that's what's in the Freeport Companion for uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. And this book is, again, one of my favorite books in it. Not necessarily because I would ever run something in uh, Freeport, although the three adventures that were published in connection with this uh, Kickstarter, which is the three initial uh, Freeport adventures that were originally published by Green Ronin way back in the day, reskinned for Shadow of the Demon Lord. If you are a new DM, to uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord, and what you'd like to do is really get, just do what is suggested and run one adventure per level. Uh, the uh, way that they've written the uh, Freeport trilogy for Shadow of the Demon Lord really lets you do that in a very, very timely fashion. Like it's like a four-hour session would all probably be all that's needed for each adventure. So you could very easily, if you're playing in eight-hour stretches. You could do it in five sittings, you know, to get through from first all the way up to 10th and still play through a really interesting story as well, too. So um, I, I'm not going to talk more about those adventures because I haven't run them yet. And I prefer to see how they play at the table before I give you any comment on those particular uh, adventures. But that's something else that you can get with this. But even if you're not interested in running those, if you're not interested in, in running your own custom uh, campaign set in the uh, in uh, Freeport, what you find in here is just, a, again, like a ton of great, easily reskinned information. Um, some of the, rate, the ancestries that are in here include the Serpent People, the Undines, which I think are awesome. Like, look at that. That's very cool. If you want to play your underwater dudes, uh, I love this as well, too. That's a great image or illustration. Um, and then it gives you a very expanded version of the background tables that you see in the core book. And these are spe uh, specified towards uh, Freeport. So, but what they also have is there are a bunch of other supplements that have been published. Again, smaller ones that are available on PDF only where they've expanded the way that your professions work. Now, if you're familiar with uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord, forgive me for repeating something, but if you're not familiar, the way that you create your, your character is you randomly generate your professions. Uh, you'll get two professions, and then sometimes your ancestry will give you a, an, another one. In the core book, that's all you get. You just get your, your profession, and that's presumed to be what you were doing before the adventure or the campaign started. But what those smaller supplements have done, and what they've incorporated in here too, is that you also get some little bit of gear to, to fit with whatever your profession is. You don't have to go out and buy the stuff as well. Because, and the reason that I think is important is because when you generate your 
like your income level to start with, you, you generate your, I can't remember if it's called class or societal tier or whatever, but it's how much money you start with. If you're playing a character who is, say, you know, he's got the profession hunter, but you start impoverished, uh, you can't afford your bow and your arrow and, and whatnot. Now there, that, you know, you may just look at that and say, okay, well, I've, uh, I'm a hunter who fall, fell on hard times. That's cool. And that's a, that's a neat kind of uh, story point to start. But it also probably will be kind of cool if your hunter had a you know bow and arrow. And that's what they do in here. Is in this version, you also get extra stuff. So if you're playing a burglar or a grave robber, you start with a set of lockpicks. If you're playing a, a murderer, you get a garrote. If you're playing a member of the watch, you start with a lantern and a flask of oil. Now, this is not the only thing you get. You also get, you know, your your whatever money you get from your uh, your income, you know, uh, tier. Um, but it's 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 a great uh, it's a great extra little bit of of stuff you get when you're randomly generating your professions, and I really like that. And again, these ones are specifically fit for uh, Freeport. So even if you're playing in a campaign with a bunch of people who just do not know Freeport at all. This helps them get that by, you know, when they're randomly generating their characters, this helps them get into that mindset very, very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because they, they can tell, like, oh, I'm actually a street preacher. Uh, so, you know, you'll then look to whatever the uh, the rig gods are for Freeport and, and go from there. Or uh, what's a uh, distinctly uh, Freeport kind of thing? A Sea Lord's Guard. So if your character, or rather your player, rolls that, well, then you're going to want to know what the hell is a sea lord, you know? So it, it sort of propels them into the, the setting, I think, uh, if they're unfamiliar with it. Then next up, we got some uh, expert paths. And some of these are very free port oriented. Like the celebrant is sort of like a drunken, you know, uh, worshiper of this kind of booze god. But then there's other great stuff like courtier. Courtier is a very social oriented class. Like it, it really relies on the social combat components of the social combat rules that are in the Shadow of the Demon Lord core book that really don't see a lot of mechanical play in other expert paths. So I really like that they've expanded the game to include that. I mentioned earlier in this review that the uh, the idea for the occult investigators, the well, courtier would probably be a really handy expert path to pursue if that's what you're going to go. I mean, again, very uh, free port oriented thing, the drowned one, but then you got the mariner. So whatever your wherever your campaign is set, if you want to play a, a sailor, this is the expert path for you. So that's that's again pretty cool. And because of the way that the mixing and matching can be done between the novice path and the expert path, your mariner might be a magician, or it might be a warrior, or it might be a rogue. And then you've got some great master paths, many of which are very uh, specific to. Uh, Freeport, but then there's also a ton of very generic ones like the Musketeer. You want to play someone who's really great with uh, rifles? Absolutely. How about a pit fighter or a sea captain or just a survivor, someone who can take them beatings and, and take them? Uh, then there is a very interesting uh, section that expands the magic. And the reason I say interesting uh, is because this tries, is one of the first products I've seen that really tries to take some of the stuff that is very DD and make it. Uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. So if you want to play a, a game that has more of those sensibilities of kind of a traditional fantasy role-playing game versus the horror fantasy that Shadow of the Demon Lord is, this has a lot of really great ideas for, for how to incorporate that. Or a lot of spells that can help play up that flavor. Uh, then there is some new equipment in here, uh, m much of which is uh, very uh, freeport oriented, but all very interesting anyway. A uh, bunch of new rules on vessels. Uh, then there are rules for aquatic adventures, including swimming and a crap ton of different ships. So check it out. There are your basic stats for a bunch of different ships, and then you can specialize them as well. Great rules for sailing and for ship-to-ship -ship combat. So <clears throat> if you want to play an actual pirate campaign out on the waters, this is great stuff. If you want to play a Viking-style campaign, if you want to play Jotun, who are raiding up and down the coast of uh, the Empire, these are the rules that will help you do that. Uh, then they give you great rules for siege engines, which I don't think we've seen in anything to date. So that, that's pretty great. Actually, that's not true. I think the Demon Lord's Companion has some rules, uh, basic rules for um, for the uh, siege engines, but that's more stuff. Then there are a bunch of relics that are introduced. And remember, the relics are kind of like the artifacts in Shadow of the Demon Lord. And 
the reason I, I again I really like this is that these relics are taken from a D and D product. So a product that's written for D and D with D and D sensibilities. These are the ways that they translate those uh, items into Shadow of the Demon Lord rules. And I found this to be the most useful thing for coming up with more D and D flavored uh, items in my campaign that was set in a D and D style world. So. These can be perfectly used in a horror fantasy game that is where you're running uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord as written with a flavor that's intended in the core book. But if you want to play more of a traditional fantasy type thing, like you want to set your game in, in the Pathfinder world in the inner, inner sea, or if you want to, you know, what you are uh, setting of your own creation or whatever, this is all really useful stuff for helping you figure out how to how to model some of those more traditional fantasy magic items and shit like that in a Shadow of the Demon Lord campaign. So again, really helpful beyond just the uh, the Freeport setting. Then we've got a really great section full of a bunch of uh, enemies, so our adversaries, and many of these are reskinned versions of the NPCs that are that were originally written for D and D or for Pathfinder. So again, it's really interesting to see if you're as much of a system nerd as one I am, to look and see, oh, here's how they built them in, you know, Pathfinder, and here's what they would look like in Shadow of the Demon Lord. So maybe that's how I would approach taking another Pathfinder product and repurposing it for Shadow of the Demon Lord. Um, and this is also like gives you just a ton of great stuff that you can reskin for other things. I've used the NPCs out of this book as much as what I've used uh, the core book. Those are the two things I've for adversary stats to make sure I'm running kind of balanced encounters. Those are the, my two go-to things because there's tons of great stuff in them. Uh, and in particular in this one, if you're looking for higher level adversaries that are basically, you know, that have followed expert paths and master paths and whatnot, and all you want is just the monster stats for them, this book has that aplenty. So again, tons of really great stuff for the, for the DM to use. Uh, then there are some signature free port monsters in here including i absolutely need to get this into a game at some point because that looks so fucking cool that is a chow i believe it's what it's called let's see if i can get the camera to cooperate there he is rar and rules for the deep one there you go if you want to play up your you know uh what do you call it um um in sport oh, gosh I, it's time of recording is friday it's been a very long week i can't believe Innsmouth. Innsmouth is what I'm thinking of. If you want to play Innsmouth style Shadow of the Demon Lord game, there you go. Um, and a lot of these things can be, again, repurposed for any setting. It's not, uh, some of the stuff is very piratey, kind of like exotic, you know, tropical island flavor to them, but you can really repurpose this stuff for, for any of your uh, types of games. And then there is an adventure. And again, I really can't speak to how good or bad the adventure is, but uh, it's. Um, it's in there. So if you want something to kickstart your game and you, you want to test this out before you, you take the dive into the actual, um, what do you call it? The actual uh, adventures for uh, Freeport, then uh, you can do that with just that book. So there are a couple other products that are out right now. Uh, there's about, I don't know, a handful of other ones that I'm not going to talk about because either they're very setting specific or I'm not super familiar with them yet. Uh, like they're, the most recent two products at the time of recording are A Land Divided and Scions of the Betrayer. Uh, I've not really dived into these yet because, to be honest, Scions of the Betrayer just doesn't... Uh, I'm going to pick it up because I'm a completist. It's not really going to probably see a lot of use, but if you're into, like, dark and evil fae, uh, in particular using them as player characters or adversaries in your campaign, this has got some great stuff. And probably if I was still running that other Shadow of the Demon Lord campaign, this would have some useful things in it. You may notice that these more like digest size books are a lot smaller than the other books. This seems to be the format that they're going for right now. I'm hoping that this isn't for all of their books because I really do like the, the bigger sized ones. But I kind of like these as well too. I like, I like the other, the you know, smaller pocket versions. What Land Divided is, is one of their setting books. There are uh, available, this is the first one that's actually been, um, and by setting, I mean just where it's just strictly, this is a nation that's in the Shadow of the Demon Lord setting. Here's what's going on there. Here's some um, a small amount of rules, but it's like a, a mini version of some of those uh, splat books, like uh, um, 
was a deadly beauty or uh, oh gosh I can't remember what is it called what is it called Exotic, exquisite agony or terrible beauty where it's a, it's more of a thematic source book these are just setting source books uh, there's also a neat book called Beyond the World's Edge that expands the setting uh, beyond just whatever's in the in the core book I'm not going to go into too much what's in here but there is one thing in particular that I really loved and that was the arc at the world's end and what this is is effectively like an expedition to the barrier peaks style thing but for shadow of the demon Lord. and it gives rules for laser pistols and laser rifles and because i'm a fucking dummy uh when i read that i suddenly realized i can use shadow of the demon Lord to run iron gods which is my one of my favorite uh campaign uh, it is my favorite adventure path that uh paizo has ever published and uh shadow of the demon Lord is probably my favorite fantasy role-playing game so um, that just gave me the epiphany that, of course, I could use this to run it. I could use this to run anything I want. But um, anyway, I, I'm not going to go into m many of the other smaller products that are available because I've got them. Uh, I do have a lot of them printed and uh, bound, but it's in black and white, and I wouldn't do justice to them. Uh, if you like anything that you've seen on uh, in the course of this review here or sort of survey, uh, or if you really love Shadow of the Demon Lord itself, if you've played the game and you, or picked up the game and read it and really like it, I would strongly encourage you to poke around at some of those smaller uh, PDF products. They're very, I mean, they're like $4 a, a pop. And usually there's a new product every Monday uh, for you to, to check out. I think more recently they've been switching to every two um, weeks, but uh, that's because there's some very big products coming out uh, very soon, including a massive new spell uh, volume, which will push the level for spells up to level 10 which is going to be bonkers because currently in the rules as written i don't know how you you really can't learn a level 10 rank or rank 10 spell oh one last thing i did want to give a shout out for now uh i have not read the setting material for this uh, a great deal but my buddy mike myler uh he published the first uh licensed shadow of the demon lord product and that is the very cool mists of akuma now, this is sort of like um, the impression I got from it is kind of like a, a weird mashup of like cyberpunk and dark fantasy and anime sort of stuff. And then with some like Warhammer 40K sensibilities to it. The book is the printed version does have color in it, but a lot of it's uh, there's some black and white, some color in it. What this has in it, though, is, again, a shit ton of great material for Shadow of the Demon Lord that you could repurpose. If you, if your characters or your players are, you know, um, more inclined towards uh, something more exotic, and and they're sort of thinking, that, well, what's there really that's uh, unique about Shadow of the Demon Lord that I could play? Well, if you pick up Mike's product here, you could play like a cyborg ninja or a cyborg samurai, and it would be perfectly balanced with everything else that you would find in all of the other products. Uh, this book has a bunch of interesting new spells that have kind of a Asian sort of flavor to it. There's a ton of great new uh, expert pads in it, including the, uh, well, actually, first of all, let's talk about the ancestries, because there's a crap ton of great new ancestries in here as well, too. Some of which are just really good representations of traditional sort of um, Asian, uh, I, uh, you know, concepts like uh, a spirit folk or a Korobokuru, like the um, uh, Asian uh, dwarf uh, that is uh, uh, one of the playable races from the original, um, we call it uh, Oriental Adventures. Then if you want to play like a monkey person, you've got your NG uh, in there. You can play a Henge Okai, who's a, like a spirit animal person. Uh, you can play a Kappa, the uh, sort of reptilian type that uh, uh, have little bowls of water on their, on their heads. Play a mutant from the wastes. So you can play a necroji. Hey, Kev, can I play a cyborg undead thing? Yep, I, I have rules for that in Mike's badass Miss of the Akuma. Uh, there are uh, Oni Touch, which is sort of like a, uh, a tiefling. Uh, there is the Sonoris, which I don't remember what they are. I think they're like psychic kind of god things. Pion, which is a little toad dude. Uh, and the schematic, which is a variant on the uh, clockwork from the core book, a tanuki. So there you go. I'm gonna play a raccoon cat. 
that, that is there for you. Tengu, so the uh, sort of, um, what do you call it? The Swordmaster sort of raven uh, folk from a lot of, uh, uh, I, think, I think it's a Japanese uh, character. Then there are some neat things called Ancestral Blessings. And what these are is another layer of template that goes on top of your character in a similar way to, or rather that goes into sort of the heady brew that is your character where you're picking your ancestry and your novice path and your expert path. These uh, often have a, uh, or at least are written to be a very sort of Asian flavor to them, but it's very easy to reskin this stuff and just use it however you want. If you want to play more of a super powered uh, campaign, this is probably what you could use to, to do that. If you want to play more of a, you know, high powered um, uh, fantasy type game. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting uh, equipment in there. And then where are my expert paths? Where is it here? Uh, there's a crap ton of adversaries in here as well. Just bear with me one moment because I, I do want to mention the, uh, the very interesting expert paths that are in here as well. There we go, 152. Forgive me for wasting air time looking stuff up, but here we go. So the other options are things like Bushibot, which is a cyborg um, samurai which is pretty badass, an herbalist, a kami guide, which I, I believe is like a, a spirit, something similar to the, the shaman, uh, a martial artist, which is, uh, I think, a really neat thing that gives you some uh, custom ways of specializing your character. So every martial artist will not feel the same. And uh, that's an, uh, it's different from the mystic as well, too. So it gives it more of a kung fu flavor rather than a mystic key, you know, point kind of flavor. There are the ninjas. And there's a private eye expert path, which I love because it. if I'm wanting to play my occult investigators, I've got one player in my uh, campaign, or rather in my uh, gaming group, who will always jump at playing the magical detective type character. Well, the thing is, in Shadow of the Demon Lord using Miss of Akuma, he can literally play a magician private eye. So he's playing a magic detective. So I think that's pretty cool. Then there are just the regular traditional samurai, the... Uh, Shinobi bot, so if you want to play a ninja robot, that is in there. The Tattooed Monk, which has a very, you know, uh, Legend of the Five Rings kind of uh, flavor to it. And the Wu Zhen, which is, uh, I think, very, uh, takes a lot of the flavoring from the uh, second edition D&D, or rather a first edition D&D Oriental Adventures uh, character class. Mike, if I have that wrong, please feel free to correct me in the uh, comments. Now, there's also, in this book, there is a crap ton of great um, setting material as well, too, that I'm not going to get into in the course of this review. I do owe Mike a full comprehensive review of this later, but I want to actually take this thing out for a spin before I uh, do that. You may notice as well that this sucker is beautiful hardcover. That is um, one of the options you've got with print on, on demand for Miss of Akuma. So again, this is just like the other books, a print on demand book, but it's just, it's a really great sturdy, but very light um, print version with, with really great colors uh, in it as well. So anyway, um, that is my very brief tour of uh, sort of what is available so far. I haven't gone through some of the print adventures that are out for it either. I've got uh, Tales of the Demon Lord, Tales of the Desolation, and then the uh, trilogy of... Uh, uh, Freeport Adventures, uh, and the Queen of the Black Coast, I believe it's called. No, what is it called? Queen of the something or other. It is a uh, another adventure path that takes you from level 0 to level 10. And I guess that's the other thing I should maybe mention. I I'm not going to review them just yet, but if you're, if you've got the core book and you don't want to go into the splat books just yet, you want to take it out for a spin and see how the game plays, Tales of the Demon Lord is something that will take your characters from level 0 to level 10. Uh, whatever that queen black, whatever the queen of the pirate isles, I think maybe that's what it's called. Queen of the something or other. There's another adventure path. That is one book that takes you from zero to 10. Uh, that it has more of a travel feel to it. And then there's the Freeport ones and the Freeport adventures is three of them, but they're smaller and they're cheaper. I believe than the, uh, the other two, it takes your characters from zero to 10 in a very quick way. And, um, and you do it in a very interesting you know, a pirate flavored setting. I can't say whether or not you need the Freeport Companion to play through those adventures or not, but uh, the Freeport Companion, honestly, I would uh, I would put that as my third purchase. If I was gonna be 
you know, expanding uh, brand new out from the core book, my order of importance would probably be Freeport, or Freeport the uh, Demon Lord's Companion, because that gives you the rest of the core book. Uh, Forbidden Rules, if you want to play with the rules of the game and, and play with the, uh, the sensibilities of how the game plays at the table. Uh, and then Freeport Companion, just because there's just so much terrific material in that. But to be honest, as you have probably picked up, every one of these books has been awesome so far. Like there's not been a product that I have picked up from uh, for Shadow of the Demon Lord where I haven't been blown away. Apart from, I mean, I the only reason why I sounded a little less enthusiastic about the Scions of the Betrayer is because I'm, I don't have a direct campaign use for it right now. And the PC related stuff is just not to my taste. You know, I don't want to play a game where my players are going around torturing mortals and stuff like that. It's just not the kind of game I like running. So that's not to say that it may not be a game for you, but um, yeah, that's the, even that book, it's really only because it doesn't play to my sensibilities, why it doesn't have, uh, you know, it's not uh, something I'm raving about. But anyway, so that is an awful lot of products that I've, uh, I've gone through here. Uh, if there are any questions you have about any of the products that I've, I've gone through that I, I didn't address in my sort of, um, you know, my whirlwind tour, please don't hesitate to leave your uh, a question in the comment section below, and I'll, I'll endeavor to, to answer your question as uh, as quickly as I can and as comprehensively as I can. Um, if you have any other questions about Shadow of the Demon Lord in general, uh, or, uh, you know, I, anything else that I haven't addressed uh, about these products that you would like me to address, please don't hesitate to leave a comment, and I will uh, I'll respond to that as soon as I can. In general, as well, I will be trying to be keeping my schedule uh, for Friday night reviews every second week on a much more regular basis now. Uh, my apologies for sort of falling out of the habit of this. Uh, I had mentioned on the channel before that I had some, there was some rocky shit that happened in uh, March, including uh, some um, illness for my poor pooch uh, and uh, some flooding in my place. But that stuff is both under control right now. My dog is doing very well with her treatment, so that's uh, that's great. And uh, the place is almost uh, back to uh, the same as it always is. So uh, expect many more reviews to be coming in the near future. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate any comments that anyone uh, will have as well. If you have any comments, criticisms, or uh, concerns regarding this uh, review, or survey, uh, again, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. Otherwise, I hope you all have a terrific Friday evening, have a great weekend, and I will see you again, hopefully, very, very soon. So thanks, folks. Have a great weekend.